Hi, I'm Chelsea. And I'm Tony Northrop. And today we're reviewing the Olympus OMD EM10. I know, not really a catchy name, but it's a great camera. Tony, what do you think so far? Well, this is our first mirrorless camera, so we went for the Micro Four Third system, which seems to be the most popular. Uh, but a lot of DSLR users like these little guys because they don't have the weight and bulk, and even the lenses are a lot smaller. And our first impression is, yeah, I love I, the lightweight of it. I love it. It's really lightweight, and it's got great image quality, too. It's got 16 megapixels. The one thing I really didn't like about it is that it's got eight frames per second, but the camera can't autofocus in between each frame. So I was trying to take pictures of birds, and the first picture was in focus, and the rest were not. If you're gonna let the camera focus on its own in between shots, it's about three frames per second, which isn't really great for wildlife photography, but I still love the camera and I'd take it on, I am taking it on vacation with me soon actually, it's great. And so far my favorite thing is that you can slap an adapter on it and then use any of your 35 millimeter lenses. They have adapters for just about everything from Canon to Nikon to Leica and including old lenses. So I have like these lenses from the 50s, 60s, 70s that I can slap on here and use. This is an old Canon FD 50 millimeter and it's just got that feel to it when you manually focus and it's got that aperture ring right on it. Mm, and so far I love using it. We should say, one thing I noticed, there's no autofocus when you put a different lens on it. Yeah. Uh, it's not communicating with your lens, so you do have to manually focus. Well, there are adapters that do let you autofocus, right? No, I can't find any that let you autofocus. Oh, there, oh. If you pay about 15 bucks, you get an adapter that gives you no control whatsoever, even over the aperture. You just always shoot wide open. And this if you pay about 50 bucks, you get control over the aperture because the adapter will have an aperture in it. If you pay about 500 bucks, you get electronic control over the aperture, but still no autofocus. Well, you can buy an Olympus lens and then you'll have autofocus and everything that you need. Yeah, or any micro four third. When you are using an adapter with older lenses, the focus peaking and magnification work just great and you can use them in the viewfinder. So I can hold this right up to my eye and it will do focus peaking that really helps you precisely focus, even though you're doing manual focus. In other words, manual focus with this is a lot easier than the manual focus that you've probably experienced on your DSLRs. Yeah, is that the feature that you showed me where it outlines everything in focus in white? Yeah. That was a really cool feature. You could see everything that was going to be in focus right on the screen. And I'll also mention that the screen is nice and big, even though the camera itself is pretty compact, which I really liked. It's also got a lot of little nice touches in it. It's got built-in Wi-Fi and a touch screen, so it's really intuitive to navigate. And if you take a picture and you want to post it on Facebook right away, you can. And you're gonna be carrying this camera with you a lot because it's about a quarter the weight of a DSLR with a similar lens. Well, let's uh, take this inside where it's a little bit warmer and we can explore the features in a little more detail. Now we've only had this camera for a couple of days, but we've been trying to work it out in a variety of different situations. So if you wanna see the actual files to investigate them and zoom in on your own computer, uh, just wait until the end of the video and I will give you a link where you can download it. First thing I'll do is I'll just pop off this lens here. Now, might as well start with this. I am using my existing Canon lenses with different adapters. And this particular adapter goes for like 45 bucks. You're paying a little more for it because it's got the variable aperture in there. So you can see because there's no electrical contacts on it, it doesn't talk to the Olympus camera at all, that if I want to control the aperture on the lens, I need to do it in some mechanical way. So this just allows you to narrow it down. It has some numbers written here which are relative. <laughs> They're pretty meaningless. It says f2.8 there, but it just means wide open. So if this is an f1.4 lens, it's always going to be f1.4 instead of f2.8. But you get the idea of how it works. In here, you can see the teeny tiny micro four thirds sensor. That's about one quarter the surface area of a full frame camera. Uh, so you get about a two X crop factor because of the smaller sensor. The button over here is the lens release. That's just what you use to take the lens off. Now I'll flip this down so we can look at the controls on the top. So in the left of the camera here, we have the mode down. You can see it's got all the usual modes that you'd experience on a DSLR, or just about any other camera program, aperture priority, shutter priority, manual priority. Over here, we have the main dial. Uh, actually, the back one here is the main dial. So if you have it in aperture priority mode and you wanna use 
uh, lower f-stop number, you can just roll this main dial here. The second button is the equivalent to that bigger dial that you get on the back of a DSLR. You know, that one that you control with your thumb, on Canon cameras at least. So this will control your exposure compensation if you're in aperture priority or shutter priority. If you're in manual mode, one of these controls the shutter, the other controls the aperture. You also see several different functional buttons here. Here we see FN1, and over here we see FN2. And those can be programmed to do just about anything you want, which is super, super cool. Now most cameras have a couple of programmable buttons, but they're fairly limited in what they can do. Here, I've set this particular camera up so that those two buttons do things that help me focus with my manual lenses here. So I have this button set up to do focus peaking, which just highlights the areas of the frame that are in focus so that you can really quickly manually focus. And the button on the back magnifies it, so you zoom in tighter, allowing you to see the detail, just both helping you to manually focus. But depending on the type of photography you do, you could set up one of those to initiate the focusing. So you could do back button focus. So you can turn off the auto focusing when you push down the shutter. And I had that working earlier and that works fantastically too. Uh, so those two buttons can do just about anything you want. You could change the ISO with them, anything. And of course the red uh, circle button here, the universal sign for starting video recording and the playback button there allows you to view your previous pictures. All right, so I'll put a lens back on so that we can see how this works. This time I'll go with my old Canon FD manual lens. I love using manual lenses on this because they are designed for manual focus. So you can see the like wicked grips that this thing has and it's got that aperture ring on it so I can control the aperture right from the lens. I guess while I'm at it, I'll bring up one more thing. By default, this camera can't tell the lens when to fire. So normally when you use a manual lens, the camera tells the lens, hey, I'm gonna fire now. And that's the point when the aperture shuts down from wide open to whatever you set it at. So you have to do that manually. And that's, that's really the worst part. So I end up shooting wide open a lot just because it's more convenient with these lenses. With this particular adapter, you can see that it says lock or open at the top here. So if I shut this down to F22, this lens is gonna be wide open by default until I turn it over to lock here. And then the aperture will go down. So if you leave it at open, you can set this to anything and it won't make any difference. So you'll generally leave it at open when you're focusing and then right before you take a picture, you'll switch to lock or you'll just be lazy like me and shoot everything wide open. It's not too bad because you have uh, more depth of field with a smaller sensor. So before we look at the back, there's this little button here that switches between the default control panel display and live view. So this is the control panel display and it's pretty traditional for compact cameras. And it's got a nice touch screen that will allow you to select the different options and that works fine, and I haven't found any particular surprises there. I'll point out that the image stabilization built into the body is customizable, so when you put a different lens on, you'll want to set the focal length of it. And I have found, I've used it with both a 400 millimeter lens and a 50 millimeter lens, the image stabilization works very differently. So I, I found it behaved very differently when I forgot to <laughs> change it from 400 millimeters to 50 millimeters. And unfortunately, there's no way for the camera to automatically recognize your lenses, so you are gonna go in there and have to change that uh, every time if you plan to use the in-body image stabilization. But I have image stabilization with this super old lens and isn't that cool, especially because you can get these lenses really inexpensive. They're not as sharp as the modern lenses, but they're still really fun to play with. Oh, one more thing, on-camera flash. If you like that, it's not bad for emergencies. You don't want to use it all the time though. Uh, I think most people who use this are probably more into natural light. The display back here pops out so you can hold it below you or you can hold it over your head and look up at it. You know, if you're shooting on the ground or you're holding it over a crowd or something. I wish it articulated out to the side, like the Canon 70D, the D5300, the Nikon. They'll flip out so you can take a self-portrait or you can see yourself while you're recording yourself. This always faces backwards. It just goes up or down a little bit. So it's better than nothing. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's fairly common. And I think it's just sturdier. It won't break as easy, but I've never had a problem with the articulating screens breaking. So. I already like the user interface better than any of my Canon or Nikon cameras. I think Nikon and Sony have a better user interface than the Canons. But this camera has a really nice user interface. Unfortunately, most of the menus don't work with touch. Touch almost seems to be an afterthought. So you can use touch to set your focusing point, but you can't use it to navigate the menu. So you kind of, anyway, it, it works fine, but it could be done better. I'm not gonna ding it too many points for that. Of course, it has all the standard DSLR features that you've come to expect. It will do seven shot bracketing. 
It will do in-camera HDR. It also has a pretty exciting feature of time lapses built in. So you can go in here and configure it to do a time lapse. And even on a $3,000 DSLR, you usually need to get a remote shutter timer and plug it in and then program it and everything. It's nicely built right in here. What an obvious feature, everybody should get it. Another minor point like that that I really like is that the maximum shutter speed is a full minute. <laughs> Whereas every DSLR I know only goes to 30 seconds for no particular reason. It's not uncommon to do even 10 minute photos, but when you're doing night photography all the time, going to a full minute is really, really nice. You can see that the intervalometer that's built into it has uh, quite a few different flexible options and it will even make a time-lapse movie for you automatically. Now, you can do that by taking individual photos and then blending them together, but it will do it all automatically for you. You can also connect to your phone via Wi-Fi and we'll show you that in just a little bit, allowing you full remote control as well as reviewing your pictures and the ability to upload them to Facebook. Now, the camera functionality itself has an extreme amount of customization, even more than I'm used to on my powerful DSLRs. You can see each of these different rainbow colored menus allows you to control different aspects of the camera's functionality. So I'm not gonna explore all of them, but just looking at this first menu here, you can see that it provides full control over the auto focusing mode, whether it's continuous or single focus. It also allows you to control, for example, setting up back button focus or whether the exposure is locked when you push the shutter halfway down or if you want it set independently. So these are the kinds of things that serious photographers really expect. The casual photographer doesn't need them. But if you've gotten used to a DSLR and you find it frustrating to use a camera phone or a point and shoot camera, you won't be frustrated with this. It has every feature built right into it. It also has nice automatic features when using a micro four thirds lens on it, where as you start to focus, it will automatically magnify for you or it will automatically turn on focus peaking. But if you use a legacy lens or another type of lens, then you just have to push a button to get it working. Here are the settings for controlling what each of the different buttons do. Uh, you can even control what the dials do in different modes. So here you can see that it's telling you in aperture priority mode what each of the two different dials does so instead of having it control exposure compensation you could have it control flash exposure compensation or something different anyway i just find that uh, terribly cool that everything can be controlled like that this is not options that i even have on my high-end dslr so the fact that i can make this mine is great once you get all these settings customized the way you like it you can save them in different what they call my set groups kind of like the custom functions on a Canon camera. Uh, the Nikon cameras kind of lack in this area especially, uh, but it's really nice that I can set it up for my specific needs and Chelsea can set it up for her needs. I have one set up here for using legacy manual focus cameras where the buttons are programmed for things like focus peaking. And then I have a different setup where I'll work with actual micro four thirds lenses that do support autofocus. So the camera can take on another personality with just a couple of clicks and you can have a lot of different personalities, portraits, wildlife, etc. So that's all the coolest stuff. Let's jump into the Wi-Fi capabilities. I'll go into the third menu here and then go down to connection to smartphone. Now I'll have to pull my phone out and I have the Olympus app installed. Oh, look at that. Have you guys heard me complain about how awful the Wi-Fi is and every other camera? This gives me a QR code. How much easier does this make the setup? And then I'll just click install here. Done. Oh, I screwed it up, but it's my fault. I just need to go into the Wi-Fi network. I have not done this before, so uh, we will really find out whether or not this works easily. Ah, there we go, we got it working, so. Here, let's focus on this other camera. So that's nice, we have full remote control, pop a few more pictures here. Then I can click the play button here and push that and then I can save it to my camera roll. Now all I need to do is I can go into Facebook or whatever 
and post it right there. It works pretty easily and pretty brilliantly. I've gone through the Wi-Fi setup on half a dozen other models of cameras and never have I used one that worked that quickly uh, or that easily. Like I said, I hadn't set it up before. I wanted to do it live on camera and it was five times faster. There was a little bit of a hiccup there, but I thought it worked just great. So let me show you a couple other physical features of the camera. Move my tiny tripod over here. Uh, on the side, you'll see that it has an AV out and an HDMI. Uh, now it doesn't have a microphone jack or a headphone jack, though I think you can uh, get a USB adapter that might allow you to do to hook a mic up into it. And the HDMI would be good for monitoring, but mostly it's good for hooking your camera up to TV and looking at your pictures or videos that you might have captured, but it's definitely not a serious video camera. I think you'd want to go into the Panasonic uh, four thirds realm for that kind of thing. On the bottom here, we have the battery and SD card cover. Uh, it's a little bit different than it is on the EM1, but we have both of them in one single compartment here. So far, battery life has been fairly atrocious for us. And uh, it seems like we managed to burn through batteries in just a couple of hours of use, <laughs> which is a little scary for something you might be bringing on long trips or long hikes, probably because the electronic viewfinder is just burning batteries all the time. You know, with a DSLR, when you're looking through the viewfinder, you're just seeing a reflection. It's just a mirror image, but this is actually working in basically an 800 by 600 display in there. So to talk a little bit about what other cameras you might be looking at, um, this body is $600 and with the cheap kit lens, it's about $700. If you're cross shopping any sort of mirrorless camera to the DSLRs, you'll see that they each have advantages. The DSLRs have just about every advantage, <laughs> except for one, and that size. The DSLRs are much bigger and heavier. Now, some people aren't bothered by that. I don't mind hiking for hours with a DSLR, but at the same time, since I've been using this, I have been appreciating the lightweight. If you're a person who wants to take your camera absolutely everywhere, and you find that a DSLR is a little bit annoying, the mirrorless is definitely your choice. This camera has a wide array of very small lenses, what they call pancake lenses, that can fit just about flush against the body and make it small enough to fit in, I don't know, the pocket of cargo shorts or cargo pants, for example. You wouldn't slip it into the front of your jeans, it'd be a little too thick, but at the same time, it's not a problem to carry around at all. You can also throw it in a purse or a hip bag if you're hip and you won't ever notice that it's there. You can even bring along an extra couple of lenses or two and you won't have any problem at all. Another advantage that DSLRs tend to have is just lens variety. There are just so many lenses out, especially for Canon and Nikon, and they also have this competition from third parties like Tamron and Sigma. Some of those third parties are starting to make lenses for the different mirrorless systems, but there isn't nearly as wide a variety. Therefore, the micro four thirds lenses especially cost more. I was just looking at a good portrait lens and the Olympus 75 millimeter F1.8 goes for, I think, $860. The Canon equivalent, actually a little bit longer, is an 85 millimeter F1.8, so it's a slightly better portrait lens, and it goes for $350. <laughs> so why would the much smaller Olympus that uses a smaller sensor cost two and a half times as much? And well, first it needs to be a little bit sharper as well uh, because the sensor is so small and the pixels are so dense. But the, the other answer is that they just don't make as many of them because there isn't as big of a market. So because more people are getting DSLRs, you're gonna find accessories a lot cheaper. For that reason, I'd have a hard time recommending any mirrorless camera system right now to somebody who wanted to be a professional working photographer because as a professional, you're gonna be investing thousands in lenses as it is. And the fact that you can get Canon or Nikon lenses for less than half the price of an equivalent micro four thirds lens will really help you out. Depth of field is another consideration if you're thinking about going from a DSLR to a mirrorless system. DSLRs, because of their bigger sensors, tend to have shallower depth of field. Now, I'm specifically talking about the micro four thirds system here because nowadays you can get mirrorless systems with APS-C size sensors and even full frame sensors on the new Sony A7s. But that smaller sensor, more depth of field, great for landscapes. It means your whole picture will be in focus from the grass in front to the mountains, or at least it'll be easier. But it makes portraiture harder because for portraits, you really like to blur the background. You wanna isolate your subject and get that nice bouquet, you know? Well, you're gonna have about half the uh, background blur with a micro four thirds sensor. 
And it doesn't help at all that the availability of fast telephoto lenses is even less. So those two things combined make it not a great setup for portraiture. I also say the flash systems, especially the remote, like multiple flash systems, aren't really available for the Micro Four Thirds system. So for that reason, if you're looking at professional portraiture, get Canon or Nikon. But if you're looking for a travel kit that can be used for candid portraits, I think these will work just fine. And indeed, you can get great portraits and a nice background blur if you get the right lenses for it. So this has been part of my photography buying guide where I am ruthlessly researching all sorts of camera equipment, cameras, lenses, flashes, studio lighting, everything you can imagine. It's uh, like 280 pages now and I'm gonna update it for the rest of my life. Uh, you can get the ebook for less than 10 bucks. So check that out. And if you just wanna see more free videos like this, click subscribe. And if you like the video, please do click like and again stay tuned because we're going to have more videos coming now here are those free sample files that i promised you